Hi, Randy. Hi, I'm Melanie. How are you today? Oh, full of the joys. The sun is shining in Lampeter. Wonderful. It isn't here, but there we are. It's grey and miserable. Oh, dear. There well, we, we have the joy of the Lord, do we not? We do. We do. We do, don't we? We do. Ah, oh, dear. So are you preaching on Sunday? I am indeed, and I'm a little disappointed. What's happened to chapter 11 of Mark? Yeah, they've missed it out yet again. And it would have been... Uh, Why would you miss it out? It, it would have been so helpful to have had it as you build the cumulative argument of uh, Mark 12, but there we are. And yeah, the earlier... it's pretty important. Yeah, and the earlier sections of Mark here, the rest of chapter 12. But there we are. Yeah. Because yeah, it is it's vital, isn't it, in our understanding of what's what's going on? Because we just randomly meet a scribe, but we've got no context for this scribe. Yeah. And what we've what we would have already seen if we'd have been in um, chapter eleven to start with, we've got uh, Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. That's the next thing that happens after blind Bartimaeus, isn't it? Jesus enters into Jerusalem. And that triumphal entry on the donkey. And then you've got the incident of the cursing of the fig tree. And I, I love that when I do Christianity Explored, it's always a question on the fig tree because yeah. it seems it seems so bizarre. Yeah. Of course, when we read it in its context, it's um it is either side of the cleansing of the temple, Jesus pronouncing God's judgment on the, the religion of the day. Yeah. Um and then you've got the proponents of that religion of the day, the uh, Pharisees, Herodians and the Sadducees, who all come and try and trap Jesus with difficult mm -hmm. questions, don't we? And he finishes by telling them in verse 27 of chapter 12 that they are quite wrong. So yeah. Jesus never minces his words, does he? Especially when he's dealing with the religious authorities. But they're quite wrong. But then you meet this scribe, don't you? And he's a little bit different. One of the scribes, so not the big groups of these people having a go at Jesus, one of the scribes comes near. Comes near. That's, I don't think that's um, accidental wording. He's coming uh -huh. near to Jesus because he's heard the answers that Jesus has given. And he's been quite impressed with the answers that Jesus has given. And so he wants to hear a little bit more of Jesus, doesn't he? So he asks one of the hot topic questions of the day. So not a trick question, but a question that the rabbis would have been debating. Which commandment is the first of all? Now, it's quite a, a big one. It, I mean, it's got an, it's got an underlying um, misunderstanding, you know, that you can rank the commandments as to, you know, well, we've got to do these ones. These are the really important ones. And, you know, some of the others we can leave be, which is a... Uh, you know, I think a misrepresentation of, of what it means to serve God. But that's by the by. Which commandment is the first of all? And there were a lot of commandments, weren't there, Andy? So they say. Yeah. Weren't there about 600-ish? 613, my notes tell me. Well done. And each of those, each of those commandments in the Torah relate to the letter of an alphabet of the Hebrew version of the Ten Commandments in the Torah. Bit of useless information for you. Well, oh, beautiful symmetry. Indeed, indeed. But he wants to know the answer, I think. What what do you think, Andy? You see, I'm not I'm not so sure it is a genuine question. It might be a good question, but I'm not sure it's a genuine question. Um partly because of the context of the whole chapter. So it's what is somewhat like the third or fourth incident. And I also find it interesting to read Matthew's account because Matthew is more explicit on the motivation of the guy. So, so maybe it's just as usual with the Gospels, they see the Gospel writers see different things. But Matthew uses, says, this guy came along to test him, to test Jesus. But you know, who knows? 
I don't, I don't, point, I I don't think... see that emphasis in Mark. I, I don't. I I think that coming near um, and that he's not far at the end. Mm. Um, I I think those would be indications that this this guy is an inquirer. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe. 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 And Jesus's answer shouldn't really have surprised him, should it? Well, he, I mean, he, it doesn't. It doesn't surprise him in a way, does it? Because when you go down to thirty-two, the man's response, he says, "You know, you're right." Mm. But his, I find his response really interesting because. You know, Jesus answers, we, we know his words famously, don't we? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. So we start off with God, and it's it's the words of Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 5. The man would have prayed these words every day as a good devout Jew. They're absolutely fundamental. He would know them well, but it starts with God, doesn't it? That He is the Lord our God, and He's one. You know, He He's he, He's the Lord. You know, you start with Him, and because He's the Lord, and that that brings all sorts of uh, ideas into mind as to all the things he, who He is, His nature, what He's done, and our response is to love Him with everything, all of our being all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, and to, to see that lived out in how we treat others. And that's still fundamental to, to what it means to be a, a person of God, isn't it? It's to love God with all of ourselves. Yeah, that's right. Um, we all fail at doing that. Yeah, and that's why Jesus came, ultimately, because, you know, if, if that's if that's your benchmark for heaven... Yeah. Well, none of us make it, do we? Not one of us. There's only one who ever could do that, and that was Jesus himself. Nobody else can can do that. that yeah. That, that's, why we, that's why we need uh, Jesus to come. But I do think it's quite interesting when the man reports back, because you're right, he says to Jesus, you're right. But then look what he adds in his answer. Uh, you've truly said that he is one, and beside him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the strength, to love one's neighbour as, as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, I wonder why he added that bit about burnt offerings and sacrifices. Yeah, you know, even those most sacred duties of the the old covenant Ain't going to get you into heaven. It's that right relationship with God. And it, the penny's dropped a little bit for this man. He, he's grasped that really important fact, hasn't he? Mm -hmm. And I, I found one of the commentaries I read, it quoted another rabbi of the time, or a bit before actually, but nevertheless, so sort of teaching. He said, the world rests on three things, the law, the sacrificial worship, and expressions of love. Yet this guy is clocked. Actually, the sacrificial system, um, without the love of God, lived out in the love of neighbour, is is pretty meaningless. Really, it's not important. I think that's quite a big step for this guy to make, considering his background. But not a big enough step. Hence, you get uh, the second half of verse thirty-four. So a big step, yeah, but not big enough. No, but Jesus saw that he's answered wisely. So so he's he's made more of a connection than many of his peers, hasn't he? Yeah, he knows the Jewish scriptures. Yeah, well, his peers were picking and choosing, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Because you're right, it's in the Jewish scriptures about the the, the relative status of the burnt offerings you know we see it in that really interesting encounter when Saul is uh is defeated the Amalekites and he's been told that he's not to not to leave not to take any of the spoil everything everything's got to go and he he gets the best of everything and he keeps it and um is it is it Samuel who's uh 
I think it's still Samuel, isn't it, with Saul? It's Samuel. He says, well, what's this bleating of these uh, sheep I can hear? And he says, oh, yeah, that, well, those, well, do you know what? I, um, I kept them back to offer a sacrifice for the Lord. And he's told, well, actually, the Lord doesn't want your sacrifices. He wants your obedience. Mm -hmm. That's uh, 1 Samuel 15, 22, a bit of a paraphrase by me. But, but the, you know, that's the important thing, isn't it? Is, um, is actually, it's not the religious ritual that's important to God. It's where our hearts are. And we get yeah. that in other places, Hosea 6, 6, Proverbs 21, 3, some of the Micah other bits. 6. So it's there in the, in the scriptures. Yeah. So what do you but think it means by not far even, from the kingdom of God? Even though, even though you know all this stuff, you do all these rituals, you know what's at the heart of uh, the Chris of Christianity. You ain't going to get to heaven just by having um, proper theology. It's actually by drawing close, drawing near to the Lord Jesus, isn't it? Yeah, and that, and that is a key thing for us as evangelicals to remember, because we, especially as conservative evangelicals, we we quite hot on having good theology, but. Good theology alone, beautiful as it is, <laughs> isn't it enough, is it? No, that's what Jesus is saying, isn't it? You're still on the outside. Go on. Would it surprise you to know that J.C. Ryle's got something to say on that matter? I'm sure he has. Yeah, I'll find it for you now. He says, let us beware of resting our hopes of salvation on mere intellectual knowledge. Education alone will never make a Christian in the sight of God. We must not only know the leading doctrines of the gospel with our heads, but receive them into our hearts and be guided by them in our lives. May we never rest till we are inside the kingdom of God, till we have truly repented, really believed, and have been made new creatures in Christ Jesus. If we rest satisfied with being not far from the kingdom, we shall find at last that we are shut out forevermore. Yeah. Yeah. So he, Good man, so JC Ryle. Oh, no. I wonder what he was like as a boss, though, if you're one of his clergy. I bet he'd be a bit scary. <laughs> but anyway, but, but this guy, so going back to this guy then, so he's not far, he understands it, but he's not actually, that we can see, and from what Jesus has said, able to give his whole self yet we meet somebody by the end of the chapter mm. who really does because this guy i think is 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 paired with the widow in um, verses 41 to 44 mm -hmm. and this also adds to my my belief that he is he is genuine because there's two contrasting things going on you've got the scribes commended by Jesus, you know, he saw that he answered wise. I think that's, that's commended him, I think. And you've got the widows commended for, for giving all that she has to God. And in between, you've got two lots of the scribes being judged. Scribes, plural, a bunch of them. Um, so so we're, I think we're meant to look at these two characters together, but they also contrast because the scribe, he doesn't give it all to God. He recognises that's what's needed, but he doesn't do it. Whereas the widow, she's got no learning that we that we know. I mean, she could have been a very clever widow, but that's not the impression we're given. She's she's a very poor widow, yet she gives everything to God. And we're called to be like her, aren't we? Yeah. Which is a huge challenge, actually, isn't it? It's very trite to say it, but what a challenge to live it. Yeah. Yeah, the teacher of the law, we don't know what happened to him, do we? Did he? Or did he just walk away? I know. And that's because I was thinking, because I was thinking, in some ways, he's like Nicodemus, isn't he? Because I thought, you know, Nicodemus is a Pharisee and he comes away from the Pharisees to see Jesus on his own, doesn't he, at night? And to ask Jesus some pretty deep questions. But we we meet Nicodemus again, don't we? And we see in Nicodemus in John's Gospel a progression in yeah. his faith. Yeah. You know, we, we see him, you know, next time we meet him, he's standing up for Jesus in the Sanhedrin. And then the time we meet him after that, he's helping Joseph of Arimathea 
take Jesus's body off the cross. Yeah. So, so Nicodemus, although at the time we don't know what he does because he just goes away, doesn't he? Um, but you think, well, Nicodemus has been born again because of the way his life has changed, the boldness to stand up against the Sanhedrin, the very people who killed Jesus, effectively. You know, he stands up. Yet this guy, we 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 don't meet again. He's not far. Does he get there? Maybe the reason we haven't got the answer is because we've got to ask the question for ourselves. Maybe, maybe. You know, because is... Mark does. Mark likes to do that, doesn't he? That's how he ends I... his gospel. Yeah, I exactly. Want you to answer answer the question for yourself in the light of everything that you've learned, and particularly when he starts talking about cost. Yeah. yeah. Well, enjoy preaching on it. Thank you. Thank you. I shall. You got anything exciting lined up for the rest of the day? Oh, no, I don't think so. Okay. Have you? Oh, well. No, I don't think. Take care. Have a good day. And you. Bye-bye. See ya. Bye.